Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Tonight we'll be talking remotely with Dr. Ira Kirschenbaum. Dr. Kirschenbaum is an orthopedic surgeon who is the chairman of orthopedic surgery at Bronx Lebanon Hospital in Bronx, New York. Good afternoon, Dr. Kirschenbaum. Good afternoon, Dr. Seacrest. Well, Dr. Kirschenbaum, tonight what I thought we would talk about is, is a, uh, a procedure that is, is sometimes confusing to patients, and that's what, what we would term a revision total knee replacement. And for you and I, what that means is that the patient has already had one or two, maybe even three artificial knee replacements in the same knee, and perhaps those uh, knee replacements have worn out, they've become loose, or for some reason, we're now going back in and replacing a previous artificial knee replacement. So that's what we would refer to as a revision total knee replacement. And as I understand it, revision total knee replacements are a little bit different than the first time you place a total knee or an artificial knee replacement in a knee that's never had any type of artificial knee placed before. So if you could, let's start out by talking a little bit about the difference between a revision and a primary artificial knee replacement. Well, thank you. The, the major difference, first of all, is that in a revision knee replacement, as you said, the knee itself was previously operated on. Now I want to make a distinction between converting any previous knee surgery to a knee replacement versus a revision knee replacement. The difference is sometimes you could have had a different operation, maybe a fracture, maybe some screws put in. That's a very different thing we're talking about right now than having a total knee replacement already in, it failing, and then going on and getting a second one or a third one. That's the topic we're talking about, revising or removing an old joint replacement and placing in a new one. So I'd like to first of all start with a clear definition for the patient so they clearly know what we're talking about. Now let's talk a little bit about the difference of these two because you know, I think one of the things we, we need to clear up with patients is that you know, we've been doing total knee replacements for a long time now, and, and total knee replacements normally don't last your whole lifetime. I mean, if, if, if a knee replacement lasts 12 to 15 years, that's usually a pretty good run for that first artificial knee replacement. So as, as the population is aging more, we're seeing revision total knee replacements, not because there's something necessarily wrong with the way the first artificial knee was done, but we're just wearing them out. People are living long enough that they're going to need that second uh, knee replacement. Um, so I think, I think we need to clarify that just because you, you, your surgeon is telling you you need a revision doesn't necessarily mean something is wrong. It's just that you, you've probably got all the life out of that uh, knee replacement. Now I think the other thing we should point out too is that, is that some of these knee replacements don't work as well as we would like. And I, I'm hoping that you're gonna go through some of the statistics about you know, what to expect from a knee replacement and, and why we end up having to do these revisions um, uh, when those knees begin to fail. But I think that, that patients need to understand that, I guess in general, this is a much, I would say bigger operation, not necessarily a bigger operation from the standpoint of it, uh, you know, it, it requires a bigger incision or something like that, but there's a lot more involved with trying to get that artificial knee out of the knee get the knee prepared so that you can put another knee in on top of it. Um, so give us your ideas about, and philosophy perhaps, about when you sit down and talk to a patient, how do you prepare them for that big operation? Sure. Well, first of all, irrespective of why the previous knee failed, as you said, whether it wore out in time, the plastic wore out, and a variety of other reasons, which I guess we can touch on later. The first thing I say to a patient who needs another knee replacement is, right off the bat, everything is worse the second time. Everything is worse the second time. That doesn't mean it's a disaster and they won't get a good result, but every aspect you can expect not to be better. Let me go through some of the categories that I talk with patients about what's not better. First of all, complications. Infection rate after a revision knee replacement is higher than infections after a primary knee replacement. 
That doesn't mean you're going to get infected. It means that your chance, your chance of getting infected is higher. Some people say as many as two to six times higher with a revision. The second thing that's worse is your motion. It's very common to have less motion after a revision knee replacement than after a primary. The third is stability. It is possible because of worn out parts of the previous knee that erode or injure the ligaments and the stability structures of the knee that the second knee is a little more unstable which means it would wiggle a little bit more and it may not be as strong. And the last part is your general feeling about whether or not you feel this operation was successful. Essentially what I'm referring to is patient satisfaction. If you were to look at a hundred patients who had a primary knee replacement that the surgeon would look at the x-ray and say this is successful and they have a good range of motion and take another group of 100 patients who had a revision knee replacement which had good range of motion and the surgeon looked at the x-rays and thought it was successful the group of patients who had the primary knee replacement would perceive their knee as a higher quality result. Reasons? Again, stability, motion, flexibility, that's one of the major things to think about. Now that doesn't mean you can't get a remarkable result from a revision knee replacement. On an individual level, statistics don't have much bearing. I have done many revision knee replacements where the patients have done remarkably well. But if I look at larger numbers of patients, I would find that there is definitely a decrease in the quality of the results no matter how successful the revision surgery turned out to be. Now what about things like pain? Do you find that patients with a revision knee replacement have a bit more knee pain after, than patients after a primary knee replacement? The issue of pain after a revision knee replacement is hard to assess for a number of reasons. First, pain is an individual patient issue. There are people who can go through dental work without Novocaine and other people need general anesthesia. So right off the bat, it's hard to compare pain from one patient to another entirely. The second is, people who need a revision knee replacement often come to me with a lot of pain because of the failure of the first knee. So they will perceive the operation, hopefully as an improvement over the pain previously. But to answer your question in an experienced way, what I have seen in the last 15 to 20 years in my practice is that the pain after a revision knee is on a bit higher level. There's a lot more surgery going on, a lot more scar removed, and in general, if you had to compare a group of 100 patients in one or another, the revision group would have a bit more pain, but I don't consider it extraordinary difference, just so you know. Now let's talk about a couple of other things you said. I, th I think it's pretty clear that, that infection, if it occurs, it is a, a thing that, that all surgeons and patients should fear because that, that really puts the, the, the surgery in a whole different classification. It's probably going to require additional surgery to get that infection cleared up. But you made, you made a couple of other comments. One was the range of motion, and the other was the stability. How do I, as a patient, what symptoms do I feel when that knee is unstable? How, is, how am I going to know that that knee is unstable? And we're referring, of course, to after the revision surgery, whether it's unstable. That is correct. Yeah, most of the time, that's going to be in activities where you're bending the knee and turning. For example, if you're going up and down steps, or if you're squatting a little bit, or you're going up a curb and turning to the side, usually the stability when a knee is perfectly straight is fine. It's usually going to be in what we call mid-flexion, when your knee is partially bent, if you're unstable at all. But you will feel a sense of your knee not quite supporting you as strongly. Now, over the last five to 10 years, the device industry, 
has developed quite a number of advances in the quality of the revision knee replacements to compensate for the lack of ligaments and to bring you back some of that stability. So a good joint replacement surgeon would use every one of these tools available to make sure if your ligaments are not fully supporting you, then the metal and plastic with more stable implants, different kinds of implants from the companies would substitute for your inability to be stable with your own ligaments and offer stability through the metal and plastic. Now, let's go back to the infection again once, once, once again. You had mentioned that there's a higher rate. We probably should give patients some idea of, of how much of a higher rate there is between the primary knee, knee replacement and the revision in terms of the risk of infection. I mean, are we talking 10 times higher, 100 times higher, or just a little bit higher? Well, you know, we have to think of it in terms of a risk factor rather than thinking 100 times higher or one or two. First of all, let me give you a line that I use with all my patients. A complication happens in 100% of the patients who get it. So if you are the person who did not get infected, you didn't get infected. So if we say in a particular hospital area, the infection rate is one out of 100, we can argue that the revision rate could be as much as three to six out of 100. Now, so in some studies, we've looked at revision rates six times normal. But if your normal rate is one out of a thousand, six out of a thousand is still relatively low. What I find is infection rates after revision also have a lot to do whether or not the surgeon adequately worked you up, which means evaluate it before your revision surgery as to why you failed. I have seen a number of people come to my practice because I do quite a number of revisions sent to me from other orthopedic surgeons. People who have been indicated, been told they need a revision knee operation, but nobody stuck a needle in their primary joint to see if it was infected. Whenever I take a person for a revision, I do an infection workup even if it doesn't look infected because one of the most common causes of infection of a revision is most probably a missed infection as the cause of the previous failure. You can't assume the loosening or some reason it failed even many years later is just wear and tear. Every one of my patients who goes for a revision operation gets an infection workup to see if infection was the cause. I will tell you that if you do that, your number of infected revisions goes down because you're finding infections before you go in and revise. I hope that makes sense in how we look at preparing a patient for a revision knee replacement. Well, I think a couple of questions there. One is, is, is what, what does that entail? I mean, what type of test do you do before you take that person into the operating room to, to try to see if they have an infection? That's one. And I think the other thing you need to explain to patients probably is, is how these infections occur maybe five, six, even 10 years after the person has had surgery. You know, there's, there's not anything going on in the knee at that point. We assume that if the knee uh, has been four or five years out from surgery that it's not, the infection is not coming from the time of surgery, this, the same way we would if we see an infected knee within the first few weeks or so. So I guess two questions here. One is, is how do you try to, what tests do you need to do? What types of evaluations do you do to try to rule out an infection? And then a little bit of background about how does a knee become infected 10 years after you put it in? In evaluating a knee replacement, a primary knee replacement that has failed for an infection, I group it into two categories of tests. One is indirect and one would be direct. An indirect test would be, first of all, some laboratory work. Some common blood work would look for a high white count or other indirect tests. Some of them may not mean a lot to patients when they hear it, but one is called an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, 
and the other one is called a test called a C reactive protein. These are simple laboratory tests that if they are elevated are an indirect sign of a possible infection. Two other indirect tests which are at times fairly accurate, one is a bone scan which looks at the general bone activity. Now a bone scan will be positive in a setting of loosening without infection and with infection so it's not the best test. But there are other nuclear medicine tests. One is called a white cell scan. A white cell scan is where the nuclear radiology physician removes your own blood from the body and places a nuclear tracer on your own white cells and these get re-injected back into you. The white cells go to areas of infection and light up on the scan. So a white cell scan is a much more sensitive indirect test. The most direct test, especially in the knee, is simply for me in the office to stick a needle in the joint. I pull out fluid and send it to the lab to see if it grows out bacteria or bacteria show up to the pathologist so he can tell me whether or not there's an infection. So in a knee, I will often do a C-reactive protein or another lab test with a white cell scan with a what's called knee aspiration. I do all three, they give me a total picture. So that's the first way to evaluate it beforehand. In answer to your second question, which is related to the idea of how does a knee many years later get infected? I find the most common is a change in the patient's immune status years later. I have seen a number of patients come to me who had a knee replacement, let's say for example 12 years earlier, 13 years earlier, they've since developed some type of cancer. They go through chemotherapy, their white cells go down, they are not able to really combat even any type of infection that's going throughout their body and I have seen a number of patients in this setting. So when people's immune status goes down, that's an issue. We're really not 100% sure why it happens. We believe it's through some type of infection from another part of your body that what we call seeds the joint. Although that's not fully clear because many people get all kinds of infections years after their joint replacement and don't infect the joint. But some people may be more susceptible to others based on their ability to fight the infection. So years later, it's usually from an infection from another part of the body that caused bacteria to go through the blood and for reasons that I believe are really not clear now, some people what we call seed their joint, but most people don't. That's why we don't see infections common much later. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, more preparations for undergoing a revision total knee replacement. Is there anything that you do other than this uh, infection workup, trying to make sure the patient doesn't have an infection in the knee? Is there anything else that you would do differently when you're getting a patient prepared for a revision total knee replacement that perhaps you don't do when you just do a regular primary total knee replacement? As we spoke on a previous interview one time, we're fairly comprehensive in having our own in-house internists evaluate all our primary knee replacements and total knee replacements. So from a patient preparation, it is the exact same seriousness in the evaluation of your underlying diseases, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, all these things have to be optimized. One of the differences I do with the revision, I do expect more blood loss afterwards, and I would talk to the patient about the possible need for transfusions of blood after a revision, which is very uncommon in my practice during a primary knee replacement. But a revision often needs some type of blood transfusion afterwards. So I would prepare the patient for that, possibly take some of their own blood before surgery for reinfusion later. And I think that's probably the only difference between preparing a primary patient versus a revision from the patient's point of view.
There is a remarkable difference in how the surgeon, though, prepares for both of these operations. Well, let's move on and talk a little bit about the operation. What are the differences between a, a primary total knee replacement and, and the revision total knee replacement? You know, simple things like, I'm assuming it takes a significant amount of time longer. Uh, it's a little bit more involved, uh, a little bit more equipment uh, involved with that since you do have to remove parts of the knee. But describe for me the difference between uh, you know, what goes on in the operating room, what the surgeon has to think about when they're doing a, a, a primary versus a revision total knee replacement. When a surgeon does a revision total knee replacement, the thinking starts the minute he sees the patient, looks at the x-rays that he, are in front of him, and begins the surgical planning. If you plan correctly the flow in the operating room and your ability to get the patient out safely with the goal of a stable knee through a full range of motion can be met. Let me give you an example. Sometimes when people fail a previous knee replacement, they have associated loss of bone where some of the polyethylene wear debris has worn away some of the bone that was previously there. So the patient does not have as much of a base to put the implant on. The surgeon has to be prepared to address this issue in the operating room, which means a revision surgeon will have, number one, the proper tools to remove the previous joint replacements that's there to not cause more bone loss. The second thing is he may need some bone from either a bone bank, which is cadaver bone, or some type of synthetic bone substitute to substitute for the bone loss. And the third thing is he may need to bring in different types of implants that have metal augmentations, which are metal blocks that compensate for the bone loss. If the surgeon is not prepared for those series of events, all the what ifs that can happen, it's going to be a very long and terrible experience for everybody. But a good revision surgeon has all the tools to remove and all the necessary bone, ligament, and metal implants to be able to compensate for what he or she can see. It's almost like being a Navy SEAL and being prepared for anything that could happen. In the operating room itself, the first level is the proper removal of the implant. And this includes an exposure, which means an incision and removal of scar that takes into account knowing where the scar is and where the ligaments are. And an experienced joint replacement surgeon will be able to tell that difference and be able to preserve the ligaments. So the exposure is extremely important that it's done with the most minimal amount of trauma, although you have to take out a lot of scar tissue. As soon as you expose the knee and show the problem completely, the next step is the actual removal of the implant. Now sometimes the implants are loose, so they come out quite easily. Most of the time, if they failed because the plastic failed or the metal cracked, then what happens is the metal sometimes is well fixed to the bone. And the surgeon has to use a series of very high speed cutting tools or special types of ultrasonic tools to break the cement metal bond or the metal bone ingrowth bond and remove the implant without removing too much bone. Sometimes that is really the difference between an experienced joint revision surgeon and not, how much trauma they do to the remaining bone on removal. Ideally, you'd like to remove as much of the metal with moving as least amount of bone and leaving most of that behind. Because you don't want to give yourself a situation where you've cracked the bone or caused a fracture in the bone while removing the implant. So removing the implant has to be with keeping as much bone behind and the most minimal amount of trauma. 
The next step is for the surgeon to step back, whether that could take eight seconds or eight minutes, however long it takes them, to evaluate essentially the landscape of what has happened now that the implant is behind. Where is their bone loss? Where is there more bone in one area versus another area? Are the ligaments intact? Are the ligaments strong? Can I build this up with metal and plastic or do I need cadaver bone? And those are the decisions that go through. I call that developing the construct or essentially the architecture. It may be a combination of all those things. Once that's done, the surgeon recuts the bone to fit the new implant or the new construct, which would be implant plus bone or implant plus metal augmentations. Once that's placed in, a trial is placed in, not the final, to see if you have a knee that is straight and stable through a full range of motion. Once that's done, that is cemented or fixed into place by whatever means the surgeon uses. And then comes the last step, which is the careful and meticulous closure of the knee to make sure that it's properly closed with the right amount of tension and after it's closed to check the motion one more time to make sure the knee is stable through a full range of motion. And how long does this take? I mean, is, I'm assuming that this is very variable in terms of how much work you have to do, but, but how long is the operative procedure compared to for example, when you do a primary total knee replacement? Well, time is a very interesting thing because some surgeons operate uh, a knee replacement a little quicker than others. And I don't really think of it in terms of speed. I think of it in terms of rhythm. A good surgeon has a rhythm that follows a certain pace. But in general, no matter what is your time to do a primary, revisions are usually two to two and a half times longer. For example, I usually can get out of a room with a primary knee, place, knee replacement in a little under one hour. All right, I can do 100 knee replacements in a row, and you can average, by the time I'm out of the room, 50 to 58 minutes. On revisions, I'm looking at a solid two hours. On revisions that require bone graft plus metal augmentations, I may be looking at three hours because I have to fashion a bone graft to make it fit perfectly and that could be a tedious process. So you're looking at two to two and a half times and sometimes three times longer than a primary to do a standard revision. Well let's move on a little bit to the post-operative course and I'm assuming that, that you've already said that everything is worse. Tell us a little bit about the post-operative course. The post-operative course, initially, we worry again about the increased blood loss. So for the first 24 or 48 hours, we find that we have to take a careful look at the patient to make sure their blood counts are normal and they don't drop. Scar tissue often has a lot of bleeding. And when you thoroughly remove it for a revision knee replacement, you will get more bleeding. Now we're using a lot of new techniques such as trying to seal the bleeding surfaces with sprays, various what's called fibrin sealants. But even with these new techniques, you're going to get more blood loss. So the first 24 hours, everyone is on a more careful watch than a primary. Not to say that we're not very careful with a primary, but it's a degree of intensity. And I will find with number of my revision knees, they will more likely go to what's called a monitored bed, which is a step-down unit or an ICU for 24 hours just due to the magnitude of the surgery. The second thing is that in the post-operative period, I expect, as we talked about, a little bit more pain. So we, though we get them up the first day after surgery, I don't expect they'll be moving quite as quickly. But the protocol, surprisingly enough, in the post-operative period is almost identical to that of a total knee replacement. We get them up early. We often use a machine that moves the leg at least four to eight hours a day when they're resting in bed. We start physical therapy once, twice a day, and we get them walking as soon as possible. 
So I don't put any special restrictions on the post-operative physical therapy program with my revisions. Now, what about hospital stay? Do you find that uh, people who have gone through a revision knee replacement stay in the hospital a bit longer than your primaries? I think if we were going to look at a large number of revisions, which I do, we'll find our hospital stays certainly average about two days longer. A lot has to do with the timing of getting out of the intensive care unit or the first days or the needing of a blood transfusion. It's not very common for me to have to give a blood transfusion after a primary knee replacement, but it is common to need one or two, and that could delay the hospital stay a couple of days. I don't find that either pain or lack of motion delays my hospital stay. It's usually the blood, the blood count, or a medical reason that would delay the hospital stay. Keep in mind when somebody fails a primary knee, maybe 15 years after they first had the operation, they're 15 years older and they may have quite a few more medical problems than they may, might have had on the very first knee replacement. And all of these in large groups of patients contribute to a slightly increased length of stay on average, in our hospital at least. And after the patient is home, I mean, what's the difference between the revision and the primary? How fast can they, you know, get to doing things like driving, like going upstairs, get rid of crutches if they're using them or a walker? Do you find that the revision total knee replacements are a little bit slower to, to come around with those activities? I think they are slower to come around with those activities. Don't get me wrong, I will find many revision patients who after the surgery bounce back as fast as a primary. And those patients do exist. So if you're going to get a revision, you shouldn't assume you're gonna go slowly. But again, if, if there were 100 patients and, and we'll define primary knee replacements as getting back to activities 10 out of 10, revisions go at a speed of about seven out of 10. They're just, everything's a bit slower. For example, though not a rule of thumb, oftentimes I could have a primary knee replacement who I did their left knee, probably start driving at about four weeks, certainly no later than six. Right knee, they probably don't drive for six weeks, probably eight. On a revision, they may not drive either knee for at least two months due to the swelling, the pain, the lack of motion got there early, so revisions in general move a bit slower. The good news is that a knee is a very resilient joint. It can have as much as 18 months of time to fully rehabilitate. So while it is important to get early motion, patients should understand that they could continue to improve each week for many months after the surgery. Well, I think you've probably answered my next question, and that is, when do you sit down and tell patients they're going to be pretty much as good as they're going to get, and, and they can put this behind them, and the status of their knee at that point in time is, is pretty much going to stay relatively static. It, it sounds like to me that you're suggesting that this can improve up to 18 months. Um, is that accurate? Well, that, that's a good average to say that I've seen some patients at a year improve a little bit more, but a majority of the improvement happens in the first three months. Now I like to tell primary total knee replacements that at about three months you're pretty much there. Now you may improve with your feeling of flexibility and knee feeling better, but the motion you get at three months is usually about 90 to 95 percent there. Revisions sometimes take as long as five or six months to get to where they're gonna end up. They need sometimes a second or third procedure. Now when I say procedure, I don't mean an operation. I mean something called a manipulation under anesthesia. If I was to take my revision patients, they require more manipulations under anesthesia in the post-operative period than my primaries. A manipulation under anesthesia is maybe at eight weeks afterwards. If they're lagging behind in motion, I will bring them back to an operating room. We will give them anesthesia for no more than two to five minutes, and I will bend the knee to break up some scar tissue 
to further along the physical therapy process. So I tend to keep my revision knee replacements on a bit shorter leash after the surgery because I know that they scar in more easily and I don't want them to fall behind and I will manipulate them in an operating room two or three times when I wouldn't even do that in the majority of my primary knee replacements. Well, let's talk about a few of the complications that, 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 that you can expect after a, a, a revision knee replacement. You've just mentioned one, uh, the complication of stiffness and how you, you deal with that with uh, perhaps multiple different manipulations to try to continue to get the maximum range of motion. What else are you worried about as a surgeon in the revision art artificial knee that you might not be worried about so much in the, uh, in the primary knee? Well, first I want to comment on, on the stiffness issue, and that is that patients do have to understand it's not only about physical therapy. It's what you do between the physical therapy sessions that is equally as important. The patients who avoid manipulations are the ones that work on their knee between physical therapy sessions. So I, I just wanted to add that point. The second part is really the answer to your question, what are the things we worry about? I think the first thing we worry about is earlier loosening. Let me give you an idea why. You've now removed a previous implant. Some of the bone that's left behind is not as good as the bone that's there in a primary knee replacement. So you're now fixing metal to a base that's not quite as juicy, shall we say, not quite as ready for an implant as a primary. So the fixation of a revision knee replacement is something that may not be as strong. Now a good surgeon compensates by adding what are called stems that go up the center of the bone to help augment, to help add to the fixation. But we worry about loosening of the metal to the bone a lot more in a revision knee replacement. So that is the, the primary mechanical thing we worry about. The non-mechanical thing, of course, is something we talked about is infection. Very careful about wound infections, problems with wound healing, and problems with early infections within the first two to three months due to the fact that this is a revision knee, much more traumatic surgery, and for reasons that are not fully clear, are definitely more susceptible, as we talked about, to getting infection. Other things that could happen, such as blood clots, um, called DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, we worry about them in primaries as well as in revisions, and I think we have a similar monitoring related to that. Uh, and the last thing we worry about, which is a complication, which many patients don't think of as a complication, but I do, it's a complication of call, called, I am not satisfied with the result. You can get a patient who has a revision, the motion looks pretty good, the x-rays look very good, but they're not satisfied with the result. It's maybe a little bit stiffness, a little bit of achiness, a little bit of pain that can't be explained through any mechanical thing. And I find that is much higher in a revision than in a primary knee replacement. And a patient has to expect it to not be exactly like the last. It's not like replacing an engine in a car, which should give you the same performance as the previous engine. What is left behind when you remove a previous knee replacement does not allow, with the associated scar, for the same quality of long-term result. I think that's, that's an excellent point. I think that, that it sounds like you make, you make a, a great effort to try and make sure that the patient understands that before they go through this procedure. So it sounds like your patients are already, what I could say is, is probably have realistic expectations before they go into this procedure and understand that, that they may not want to expect the same result that they got from the first uh, artificial knee, the primary artificial knee. So, so thank you for, for going through that. I guess the last thing that I would like to ask you, and that is, you know, we've talked about the revision not being as good as the primary. What about how long it lasts? How long does a primary, how long can you expect a, a, a revision total knee replacement to last 
when compared to a primary? You know, the longevity, which is the amount of time an implant lasts, depends on a number of factors. It depends on the patient's weight, the patient's activity level, the quality of the metal and the plastic. So let's look at someone who had a primary knee replacement, let's just say 12 years ago, and now needs one this year in 2010. Let's compare a couple of the features. Number one, we've had a lot of advances in improved plastics and what are called the bearing surfaces. So even a primary today should last many more years than a primary put in 12 years ago because the plastic and the metal bearing surfaces have seen a lot of improvements. The second thing is that in a revision, the patient is older. And though not always a rule, if someone's 12, 15 years older, they may be a little less active. So if we originally replaced the first one at 62, now 12 years later, the patient is 74 they may not be as active to wear it out. So if you add the improved plastic and metal bearing surface with the less activity, that part, I'm confident in a revision, should last longer than a primary for those two practical reasons. The part that I worry about that would cause an earlier failure, which could happen, is the attachment of the metal to the bone that's remaining. If that doesn't fail, then a primary and a revision knee replacement, if they had the same metal and plastic used and the same activity level of the patient, should last the same amount of time. But those variables change decade to decade. So I am confident that a well done revision in someone who has good enough bone to take the implant should last as long, and at least by today's standards, due to the improved metal and plastic through advances by industry and engineering, should maybe even last longer, at least from the plastic point of view. Well, that's good news because, you know, I think a decade ago, the, the statistics would have shown that revisions just don't last uh, nearly as long as a primary total knee replacement. I'm glad to hear that we've really come a long way in terms of, of making the revision, in some ways, the equivalent of the primary with the caveat that it's a much bigger operation, maybe a, a bigger uh, number of complications that could go wrong, but if you have a successful revision, what I think I hear you saying is that you're, you're, you should be in pretty good stead. You should have a knee that's going to last you that 12 to 15 years that we used to expect from a, from a good primary, let's say a decade ago. Is that accurate? I think that's accurate. I think it's important to keep in mind that in the last 10 years specifically, some tremendous academic surgeons in this country have given a lot of wisdom and a lot of guidance on how to properly implant a revision. That might not have been there 10, 12 years ago. So there's been a lot of surgeon advances. But I also don't want to overlook the implant choices and the implant availability that has allowed us options for the patients that have made revisions more successful as well. The data from 10, 12 years ago represented both the techniques and the implant available at that time. Both advances in techniques from some very excellent surgeons who have taught all of us around this country to the advances in the metal and the options to compensate for bone loss and implant these better have added to the longevity of a revision knee replacement. Well, I think that's definitely good news as our population ages more and more every year, so, so great news. Um, as we close this discussion, which I, I, wanna, I wanna tell you, I really appreciate this discussion because I think we've really gotten uh, into information that, that patients need to know, and I think that this is a very comprehensive discussion about you know, what, to, to, what to expect in terms of a revision total knee replacement. Is there anything that you feel like we haven't covered or anything else that you would like patients to know about revision knee replacements? Well, I think we've covered quite a bit. I think the only thing that I'd like to add is that it's important that you choose a surgeon 
who is comfortable with revisions. And the good news in that is there are very few joint replacement surgeons in this country who take on the revisions who aren't comfortable with it. It's a challenging operation. It's one that requires a lot of thought before the surgery, a lot of skill during the surgery, and a lot of attachment to your patient and what their expectations are, and a lot of time understanding and working with the patient on a one-to-one -one level to make sure they understand what it takes to get an optimal result. Well, thanks a lot. I think that's, that's a, a very good point. I want to thank you again for uh, sharing this information with patients and uh, look forward to further discussions in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr.